The legislature may be out of session, but there is still a lot of news coming out of Tallahassee, especially for the week ahead when it comes to the U.S. Senate race in Florida. Mike, we'll bring in our Capitol Bureau correspondent, Mike Vasilinda. Uh, Mike, Governor Rick Scott scheduled a major announcement for tomorrow, obviously expected to say that he's running for this U.S. Senate seat against the Democratic incumbent Bill Nelson. I mean, this is probably the worst kept secret in all of politics, if, if not definitely Florida politics. Sure, I think you take, uh, the, Evan, the first look is no other major Republican has gotten into this race. That would not be the case if Rick Scott had not sent the signals throughout the party that he was in and he was running. What's interesting about tomorrow is it is the eighth anniversary of the day the governor filed the paperwork necessary to run for governor. Back then, he was an unknown with lots of money, but still virtually unknown across the state of Florida. Now he's got nearly uh, seven and a half years as governor, uh, and he's still got lots of money and got lots of name recognition. So this is going to be a very interesting race. The uh, number of national pl uh, uh, forums have labeled it among the top 10 nationally. It's also likely to be probably the most expensive U.S. Senate race uh, in the country, and it is also going to be probably Bill Nelson's toughest race ever. I can imagine all of those things happening. Mike, about a four-point lead, maybe four, maybe up to six, maybe as low as one, according to the latest polling. Where do you see this race shaking out? Well, you know, that's just it. This is a very, very unusual year. The polling suggests that it's neck and neck. It's been neck and neck. Uh, Scott has had the lead. Uh, now then, uh, Bill Nelson has regained it. But almost all of the polls are within the margin of error. And when you look, this is, you know, this is only April. We've got a long way to go till November. Uh, we don't know what's going to shape the race. You know, there are a lot of ideas about what the issues will be. But what happens between now and November? If there are major hurricanes and the governor does a good job, that could help him. If there are major hurricanes and the governor doesn't do so well, that could help Bill Nelson. That's the interesting thing about uh, uh, when you think you know how it's all going to turn out. There are always these other intervening events that take place, and they really mess up the uh, conventional wisdom. You, you mentioned right there, Mike, how things can happen between now and when the race happens in November. Governor Scott is currently the governor and will be throughout this term. What about this resign to run law that was passed? I mean, is this, it, there's a carve out, I guess, specifically for Governor Scott. Is this much ado about nothing? Yeah, I, I would say it is much to do about nothing. You know, we had a situation back uh, in the uh, 1986 as Bob Graham had already been elected uh, to the U.S. Senate. Uh, he was the governor, uh, and he, he had to resign three days early to, uh, to take his U.S. Senate seat. And so we ended up with uh, Wayne Mixon, governor for three days. Uh, but we had a governor who was here for just three days. And so that's why this is about a lot about nothing. Rick Scott could not run uh, again for a third term, so we knew he was not going to be uh, running for governor. And really the idea behind resigned run is so that people don't pull a surprise. Uh, you know, there have been instances where uh, candidates have uh, not, to, who everyone thought they were running for re-election, and at the very last minute, on the very last day of qualifying, they jumped into another race, and lo and behold, one of their best friends jumped into the race that they had, and no one had the opportunity to conduct a meaningful campaign. So that's what this law was designed to do. Going one step further, this, uh, this carve-out, the uh, uh, the initially the resign to run law didn't apply to federal offices and that was done when John McCain was recording Charlie Crist to potentially be a vice presidential candidate and so the legislature said well we're going to help Charlie if uh, uh, if uh, if he is chosen and they don't succeed well this year they 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 change that law so all federal candidates have to resign to run except in this scott case and like i say it's a lot to do about nothing he wasn't running for governor again uh and it really doesn't make much difference you know we avoid having a three-day governor certainly very interesting though the fact that he will be doing the job of governor during this race leading up to november interesting to see how that shakes out all right this past week american bridge a democrat leaning group put out a release suggesting a number of reasons rick scott shouldn't run in many ways sort of laying out the negatives 
Yeah, I mean, I think you start with the nursing home deaths, you start with the bridge collapse, you uh, look at what kind of year it's going to be. You know, the uh, this is uh, normally a year that would favor Republicans because it is a non-presidential year. But we also have the midterm effect, and there's a lot of effort to uh, 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 get young people to vote after the Parkland tragedy. And so it's anybody's guess as to what's going to happen in November. Do, do, do young people register to vote? There's some indication that millions are going to be spent motivating them to register and get out. Will they vote for who? Did Scott do a good job in the response? Are they angry with him? Uh, and then just the, the entire issues of, of the things of the last seven or years of Scott's tenure as governor. The clemency issue is a big, uh, big deal to a lot of Democrats. And so we'll have not only the Trump effect, but the whole idea that uh, uh, this has been a very volatile uh, seven years in Florida and with this Parkland issue, are people going to turn out? And I think we're going to see a lot of surprises come November. You know, where the Democrats have uh, turned two seats that they shouldn't have turned necessarily in special elections, blamed partly on the Trump effect. And let's see how big that spills over. But this, this American Bridge memo basically laid out the case. Uh, I think it was almost saying, hey, you better think twice about this. But I think the governor's mind's made up. Yeah, and I certainly don't think he's going to change it due to a Democratic memo. But uh, finally, uh, you mentioned before that because this is a non-presidential election, it should favor Scott. Why did you say that? Well, you know, normally Democrats turn out in much bigger numbers, about uh, a million more voters in the uh, presidential election year than they turn out. Uh, during non-presidential election years and Republicans vote steadily in all elections and so that should favor the governor but as I said we've got all of these things going on uh, with uh, uh, the young uh, people uh, upset over gun policy and whether they actually follow through we had that discussion a week or two ago about you know they can make a big difference if they choose to stay involved and this is going to be the real first test of whether or not they stay involved through the November elections or if they lose focus over the summer and go off to college and and lose the fire that they've got right now and I think that is the big question here whether or not uh, uh, they will have that fire and they have that motivation in November and if they do then it now won't necessarily favor Rick Scott because he didn't do a lot of what they wanted to do. Mm. Not just that, Mike, but also can they get other people their age out to vote? We know young people don't vote as much as they should. So, so many questions for November. Be fascinating to see as the year develops. Mike Vasilinda coming to us from Tallahassee this morning. Thank you very much, Mike.